Okay, so this talk is about progressive enhancement. Um, probably many of you have heard this term, probably may be familiar with it. Um, if not, uh, I'll give a quick recap. So progressive enhancement uh, was first introduced uh, in a talk by Stephen Champion back in 2003. And in this talk, he sort of takes this existing popular idea of graceful degradation uh, and sort of flips it on its head. So rather than delivering degraded experiences to older and less capable browsers, he proposes a new uh, idea of this like content first strategy that focuses on uh, the baseline experience that works in all browsers. And then on top, we can build uh, progressive enhanced layers that take advantage of the more advanced capabilities of newer and more sophisticated browsers. And pretty quickly, this principle of progressive enhancement became this like mantra of the web development community, um, probably because it encapsulates uh, a lot of important ideas. So, you know, it's about user experience, um, but it's also about accessibility and inclusivity. So making sure the products we build work across a wide range of capabilities, whether that's uh, hardware, software, or like the users themselves. Um, it's also about technology choices. So if and how we use things like HTML or CSS or JavaScript. Um, it's also about development methodology and best practices. So things like uh, separation of concerns, how we organize and structure our code, um, and things like uh, mobile first development. Um, and over time, uh, you know, web development has a lot, evolved a lot since 2003 and uh, progressive enhancement has sort of taken on a lot of different meanings and uh, connotations uh, to you know different people. So if you're asked like 100 people to you know what progressive enhancement is, you might get you know nearly as many definitions. Um, so uh, you know and, you know the, the evolving technologies of web development has sort of created this ongoing debate of you know what the true definition of progressive enhancement is, or if progressive enhancement is even like relevant now. Um, so I'm actually not going to address any of that. Um, instead, I'm going to sort of add to the mess by uh, with my own take on progressive enhancement. So my name is Ryan Sao. I'm an engineer on the web platform team at Uber. And the title of this talk is Progressive Enhancement, Not Just for Websites. Um, so when you, people talk about progressive enhancement, you know, it's usually in terms of something like this. Um, but instead, I want to sort of look at progressive enhancement through a different lens, um, like a different, more specific user, um, namely developers. So rather than web browsers, I want to you know, look at developer tools. And instead of web pages, I'm interested in you know, the source code that we write. Um, so the first example I want to do uh, is kind of related to like stack type checkers in JavaScript. Um, and and you know, rather than like tell you about it, I'm just going to show you some uh, a little demo that I think will be better. Uh, flow, it's like a type checker, uh, you know, similar to TypeScript. So uh, here we have this like simple program. Um, it's like we have this greet function and it takes in like a person object that has, uh, you know, a person object has a first name property and last name property and this just, uh, you know, returns the string. This is like this greeting. Um, so we can invoke this greet function with, you know, this object here. Um, and, you know, if we run this program, uh, you know, it logs, logs out our greeting. That's pretty great. Uh, but if we were to do something like, uh, you know, greet and, you know, pass in, you know, something and maybe like I have like a typo here, um, you know, I omit the last name thing and, and we, run, we run this again, like we get some like behavior that we didn't expect. It's kind of like this error. Um, so what uh, static type checkers can do is uh, like catch these sort of things that, you know, compile time or even as you're just writing it. So uh, this is sort of the, the same code, but with these uh, flow type annotations. So here we explicitly define this person object, um, it has, you know, these two properties and, you know, where greet function takes in a person and then returns a string. Um, so the cool thing is now if we do like, you know, greet, we do the same thing and we, you know, we pass in just some nonsense here, uh, we get like this error and we, you know, it's, it statically knows that like this doesn't work. Um, and, you know, if, you know, it's, it's, it's not just that, like, you know, maybe we're doing some refactoring and, you know, it turns out not everyone has a first and last name. So like, let, let's do something better. We can do this like names, uh, array, so we have like this array of uh, strings that takes up, uh, you know, con constitutes a person's name. And so we do that, then, you know, we have these now these errors here because our greet function no longer works. It assumes we have this, these two properties. Um, and then like when we invoke this function as well, it knows that this object is not like a valid person uh, object. So, uh, you know, this, this, this is like pretty useful and, you know, helps with refactoring and just is a nice, you know, get like autocomplete for things. There's a lot of benefits that it provides. But the thing that is kind of a, a bummer is if we like try and run this, you know, as we would just our other thing, um, 
then we get this like syntax error because you know this is not valid JavaScript. We're adding these like annotations that don't exist in JavaScript, um, and so you know it just kind of blows up. And this is you know this is kind of a, a annoying because you know you can't now you have this like all this build tooling that you need to like, run your code. Uh, you can't like just run it in the browser. You can't use the normal like you know, just run, run node with like the debugger attached. Um, you know, you can't like use a lot of things that just, you know, work with JavaScript. So your portability is like, greatly reduced. Um, but one, one of the cool features, and this is probably like one of my favorite features of Flow, um, is it allows you to write these annotations in inside of a comment. So if I like wrap this stuff uh, just in, in a JavaScript comment here, um, so here's my annotations and I'm just sort of putting these annotations in comments here. Um, everything, it's Flow understands this and everything sort of still works. So I can still have that thing where if I, you know, call greet with, with some nonsense, it you know, knows this is invalid. So all our type checking still works. Um, but now if I run this thing, uh, you know, it, it works as normal. So, you know, this is, this is still like valid uh, JavaScript, but Flow understands it. And, you know, can you provide all this benefit on top of like the sort of the base uh, functionality that we have. Um, so I think, you know, this is, Kind of like a, a great example of like progressive enhancement in this context. So we have this like baseline where everything works as expected. Um, you know, we can copy paste it everywhere and it basically works. Um, we have full functionality of our code. And then we add in this sort of layer on top, uh, which gives us these like nice compile time errors and like this like super powered linting. Um, so I, like flow supports this, like TypeScript is a little different. It doesn't support this, but uh, I think like this is a really cool feature with flow that uh, provides a lot of benefits. Um, and so next, I want to talk about this library. This is uh, called HTM or HyperScript Tag Markup. This is written by the author of Preact. Um, and it's based like JSX, but it takes advantage of ESX template literals to allow us to sort of express that markup in a way that's like valid JavaScript. So uh, I have an example here. So um, this is like, you're probably familiar with JSX. Um, this is sort of like the syntax on top of JavaScript. Uh, that allows us to kind of nicely specify our markup in this way. So we, you know, have our list. You have like a list component, and that takes in like a, some items and renders. Um, you know, like we have like certain number of items, and it renders the things, and we, we pass items into the list, and it renders. Um, and you have this kind of this markup here. Um, but again, this is sort of the same issue where if you like try and like run this anywhere without uh, build tooling, it just you know just blows up because it's not valid valid JavaScript. Um, so HTM is kind of one thing that is designed to solve this. Um, so here, uh, rather than having these uh, JSX like expressions in JavaScript, it all lives inside of an ES6 template string. So this is actually one of the main reasons why the syntax was introduced. It's not just like multi-line strings. It's about like having your these like DSLs inside of a string. Um, so we can you know kind of write this in exactly the same way, except for now it's just regular JavaScript. We're using the ES6 template like interpolations here, and we're like passing in variables. Um, we can still map over like props as normal and like return the uh, like the items in the list. Um, and so we just have this like tag template little here, which we import from this HDM package. Uh, and now if we, if we run this, like uh, this sort of just works out of the box. Like we can see, we you know, have our, our HTML here that we get. Um, so, you know, this is, this is pretty great, but you know, we have this like library that we're now importing. And this is beneficial because we can run it without build tooling, but now uh, we kind of have this like overhead of this like runtime. So like at runtime is gonna, you know, parse this template string and like figure out uh, how those in, in, uh, interpolations fit into the markup. Um, so we kind of have some overhead here, but they, uh, as part of this thing, you can use uh, this like Babel plugin. And that basically does exactly what JSX does, but it works on these template literals. So if I like run Babel here, so let's say uh, on index.js and I output to compile.js. Um, so it's gonna use that Babel plugin and then uh, here's his output. So this is like pretty much exactly what the JSX transform does. And it converts all those template literals into these create element calls. So like functionally, it's identical to JSX uh, once it's been compiled. And like, again, we don't have this over because this is never actually used. Um, so we could like, you know, that doesn't necessarily need to be used. Um, and we have like sort of this zero overhead uh, you know, functionality if we want it. So uh, kind of going back to the, um, the early example, we have this a baseline experience where like everything just works. You know, we have this like, I think it's like 600 or less bytes of this library to do it at runtime. But once we add in the static compiler on top, we can compile away all of that overhead and we just have something that is like zero overhead, just like JSX. Um, 
And so the next thing uh, is kind of about testing. So uh, you, there's a popular testing library called Jest by Facebook. Um, and one of, the, one of the features that is pretty popular is a thing called snapshot testing. I think uh, this is actually kind of a misnomer. Um, the documentation, it kind of implies that this is about like visual testing or UI testing, but it's really more about um, like updating and creating test fixtures in mass. So you don't have to like manually update you know, this file, if you do some like major refi or, you know, rewrite of something and now all your tests are broken and, uh, but you like, you know, you, you don't have to like go manually update everything one at a time. So kind of how this works is, um, so, you know, let's say we have this like assertion here. So this is a test. Um, and then, you know, we have some value and then basically we say, we expect this value to match uh, a snapshot. So if we haven't run this yet and there are no existing snapshots, um, it will just generate the fixture automatically based on the value. So if I like run the test, um, it's running and it, so you can see this is right snapshot written. Um, and that basically creates this uh, snapshots directory with this like snapshot file in it. Um, and you know, you can, you, you know, it sort of just generates it again. And if you run this again, um, it just use that existing um, snapshot. And so if I like change the value here and then run the test again, it will look up the existing uh, snapshot that's on disk. And then it fails because it, you know, we, the, this value is now different from the thing in the, in the snapshot. Um, so, you know, this is kind of like pretty magical. Like, you know, it has to know like, okay, this is the name of the test, which is like kind of unrelated to this expect here. And it looks up this thing. So this is um, gonna be pretty hard to like imagine this working in a scenario where like we're just using just plain node rather than like the just CLI. Um, but they introduce a, a thing called inline snapshot. So, um, if we have the same thing, but we just change that to inline snapshot and like we can delete this, um, that snapshots thing. So basically if we now run Jest, uh, it will, instead of writing it to some external file, it just puts it in line. So this is you know, a lot simpler conceptually because it just compares, well, the left thing is that equal to the right. Um, and you know, if I uh, you know, ch change the thing and I want to like update my snapshots, I can just run it with the update command. Um, and then it, it updates, it updates this there. So you can imagine where, you know, just was something like this and we didn't rely on global variables or it was like, we import it and expect um, from just itself, or let's just make this a require. And then, you know, we could, then we could just run node directly. Uh, and then, but this, this doesn't quite work yet because they don't export the globals. Um, but, you know, we could imagine that it would be something like that. And with another thing with testing, um, a lot of people don't know is that V8 recently added like native code coverage functionality. So if you use like the Chrome dev tools and you, you've kind of poked around, there's like a code coverage feature. And when you like run your web app, it'll like show which lines have been used and which haven't been used. Um, so this is like built into V8. So we can use it from Node directly. So if you have like tests and you want to see like, oh, am I, you know, what, what is my like test coverage? Am I covering like all the sort of cases in my code? So like I have this like function here that um, takes in some value and I have this like conditional. And right now, like this is only testing the true case. Um, so like this, this line here on line seven is like untested, you could say. So if I do, if I run node with like this environment variable, um, V8 coverage, and I pass in a directory. Um, and then so node, index.js. So I can run the test and you know it's logs out, the, the cert passes, there's no like error thrown. But it, what it did is it wrote to this coverage directory here um, and it has this like coverage object which like contains all the information of you know which lines were used and you know which like conditionals um, were, were evaluated in that run. Um, and you can actually, there's a tool called C8 which uh, can like look at these reports. So you do yarn C8 uh, report and that will just dump out the coverage information that was from the prior run. So this is just looking at that coverage file. And you can see it here, like, okay, like line seven, um, that was uncovered, which, uh, you know, we expect because this condition was never tested. So if you think about like from testing perspective, um, you know, we could have this like test runner and progress enhanced test runner experience where, you know, all your tests work, um, you know, just like using plain node, you know, you could use the, the regular like, uh, you know, debugger or inspector um, and you even have code coverage without like any like build processes or tooling. Um, you could have like, you know, rely on your, in, in your existing inline snapshot tests 
and everything just sort of works. It's like super portable. You know, you can copy paste things and it will work everywhere. Um, but then when you add in this like enhanced CLI runner, you get kind of the extra niceties of like parallel test execution, uh, maybe like a watch run mode or like, you know, generating those initial snapshots and like updating them. Um, so uh, another, I guess the next pattern I want to cover is um, like kind of packaging JavaScript libraries. So we, we tend to use a lot of libraries. Um, I write a bunch of them. So uh, I made this little utility called Create Universal Package. Basically what it does is, um, you know, you write some, you know, write some, write some library you want to have. In this case, I have like these two functions I want to export. Um, and then when I have this like, uh, I have this like, I guess pre-build, uh, like pre-published step. So if I do yarn prepare, this is run when you like automatically when you publish. Um, it, it'll generate all these like different, you know, outputs. So I have uh, a common JS file for, you know, let's say I'm just using regular node and I don't have like experimental modules set. Um, then this will just work out of the box. Uh, let's say I'm like bundling this thing with Webpack. Then I have this like, yes, module export. Um, so this can get like picked up by like Webpack. And if you like aren't importing this thing, it can do like, you could tree shake the things that aren't being used. Um, and basically this works by exporting these uh, different fields in the package JSON file. So by default, like everything just looks up this main uh, entry. But if you have this module field, it will, uh, a lot of tools will, you know, understand this and be like, oh, this is the ES module equivalent. So you get kind of this, like progressive enhancement where, uh, you know, out of the box, like things are, you know, regular common JS and it's sort of standard, but then kind of you get the, the new module format uh, that allows for like a lot more optimizations if, if, the, if like, the bundler or like the tool like supports that. Um, so I think that's like kind of another example of this like progressive enhancement where you have these libraries that, again, yeah, it's just, you know, just works everywhere. So in the browser, you have that native ES module. Um, on node side, you know, they don't have that support fully baked in yet. So you have the common JS entry. Um, and then, you know, if you have, let's say this, the consumer is using Webpack or something, then they can rely on like tree shaking from the yes module and like, you know, other static optimizations that are like better from that like structure. So we can have these like libraries that, you know, uh, have this baseline experience and then the, you know, the progressively enhanced layers on top. Um, so the next one is everyone's favorite topic, uh, of course, CS and JavaScript. Um, and uh, I think the, 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 you know, if you look at, you know, how, you know, if you're just using regular CSS, um, I think one of the great features about CSS, you can kind of just throw open the uh, elements pane and you can kind of like look around and, um, you know, this is sort of just an example thing here. So, um, you know, if I look at like this button here, I can go, you know, here and be taken immediately to like the, the markup. And then right here, there's this like link to the location where uh, this code is defined. So if I want to like, okay, where, where, where is this, where is this class located in my source code? I can just click right here um, and, you know, be, be taken like immediately to it here. So it's like really easy to go from, you know, the CSS on the page to like the source code that contains it. And then with CSS and JavaScript, it's not really one-to-one -one because now all your CSS is in a JavaScript file. So like you can't, uh, you know, the CSS doesn't even like exist, uh, like, you know, in, in terms of how you're working with it, it's in a JavaScript file, it's not in some CSS file. Um, so uh, I built a little app to demonstrate uh, a thing that uh, this CSS and JavaScript library that we use at Uber um, called Styletron does. Um, so basically here we have this app. Um, I, I made this so it doesn't use like any build tooling at all. It uses uh, native modules, it runs in the browser. Um, so basically just like this index.html file, I link to the script tag, um, and this contains like my application. So here, you know, again, I'm using this like HTM thing so I can, uh, just run it in the browser with no, uh, no build steps. Um, and so like I have this like react application, it's like a counter, um, I'm using, you know, I have my state here and then of these two buttons, like increment, decrement, um, pretty standard. Um, so if I, so these are all just like kind of static files here. There's no build step. I'm just gonna serve this from localhost so I can like actually load it up. Um, and let's go, sorry. Uh, if I go here, I have this app, you have this cool counter thing. Um, and, you know, so I, I, if I go to, you know, inspect, I have these like all these like generated class names, which um, is sort of an optimization that the, uh, the renderer is doing. So like if you're doing a server-side render, any like 
reuse declarations will be deduped and we'll just use that single atomic class. Um, but you know, this what what the this library is doing is it generates this kind of like debug class here that has a source map to the JavaScript source. So if I like click on this, I'll be taken immediately to where the panel is defined. If I like inspect the button, um, you know, I, I, I can click here and just be taken right to where the button is defined. And this actually works entirely at runtime. So there's nothing, there's no build steps or anything. Um, kind of like, uh, let's see, like long story short, this sort of uh, under the hood, you have this uh, in the browser, it's like generating these stack traces and that like goes sent to like a web worker that's running uh, in the background. And so this is all like just a, a utility that works in development. So like as you're developing, it's just, you know, improves the developer experience. Um, and it will like basically map those JavaScript locations to the original source code. Um, like, you know, if you, even if you have like a bundling step, it can do this. Um, and it just sends back these like, this like little snippets of CSS that includes like this source map. Um, so that allows you to like click on this thing and, and the, the Chrome DevTools understands this source map. It can like allow you to um, display it. So uh, you know, there's, there's like a whole blog post dedicated to this, um, but I think basically this is an example of, um, you know, pr another thing with progressive enhanced. So we, we have like full functionality. There's no build steps or anything like the CSS and JavaScript, you know, it renders to the page. Um, and we even have like kind of a nicer debug experience, like in development. So we can have this thing that this web worker that only runs in development, um, and, you know, allows us to sort of like inspect the CSS as we would like to, uh, but it, you know, there's, there's sort of the CSS and JavaScript gets in the way of that. Um, so this all like kind of just works. There's no build tooling required. Um, but you know, if we have, let's say we are using build tooling or something, we can, you know, even further the developer experience, you know, have, you know, better compile time optimizations or like in development have like better warnings and errors and stuff like that. Um, uh, so, so I think, yeah, this, this is really about thinking about developer tools, but in terms of like layered experiences. So you know, we have these like baseline standards that are like, are, you know, basically ubiquitous. We have, uh, you know, JavaScript, like it runs everywhere. It's sort of taking over the world. Um, and then, you know, on top of that, we have all these like build tooling and, uh, you know, compilers, compilers and build steps. And I think sometimes it can get in the way of like, you know, adoption of anything, you know, it's like, oh, you have to use this, like, you know, this like module, I have to be using Webpack because I need to add like the Webpack plugin or, you know, oh, like this requires like Babel and I have to, you know, add the Babel plugin to do this thing to like even work. I think, that's like not really great in a lot of cases where you know maybe you're doing something like server side and like you don't even need any like build steps because you're like running a super new, you know new version of node these you know building these tools in this layered approach i think has a lot of benefits so yeah kind of in summary uh, i think you know I, I write a lot of like libraries and tools and i think it's important to you know ideally have things that just work i think this is sort of an ideal it's not always possible but i think you know you, you know there's a lot of benefits you have a faster feedback loop like you don't have any build steps at all you can just like jump into node at any file um, you, you know, you don't have any like mangled stack traces or like dealing with source maps, which like if you're having um, like breakpoints, it can be like inaccurate if you have source maps, like, you know, it kind of you're up to the, um, you know, wh whatever's generating those. And you have like greater portability, like the code you, you write can just run anywhere and you can, you know, copy it into your browser console, you can run it in Node, um, and you just have like easier setup, but you don't have to, you know, jump into some configuration file and like update the parser, you know, options like, you know, ECMAScript mode, JSX or, um, things of that nature. Yeah, that's kind of all I had. All I had. Um, I'm going to put the code up on GitHub shortly. Um, you can follow me at RTSAO.